Okay, so we are going to get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to the program today. Um, so for tonight from Orland Park Public Library, we have Beer 101, a virtual guided tasting class. Today's beer consumer faces a bewildering number of beer styles to choose from. Joint beer expert Marty Nashel for a presentation on beer styles and a virtual special tasting. So without further ado, I hand it off to Marty. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is the first time I'm doing something like this. I don't know if it's the same for you as well, but uh, we're gonna learn a lot and we're gonna have some fun. And um, I'm just gonna take a minute or so to tell you about myself and what brings me here to do this with Orland Park Library. Uh, I've been into beer, specifically craft beer, for about 30 years now, which if you look at the timeline, that brings us back to about the beginning of when craft beer uh, actually started uh, becoming known here in the United States. It was kind of a movement back in the 1980s, and uh, shortly thereafter is when I became aware of it, and um, I was very interested in the concept of small breweries, small local breweries, and, uh, you know, most of the beers that were known to everyone back then, the Anheuser-Busch, uh, the Anheuser-Busch beers, the Miller beers, the Coors beers, all of those big corporate brands, and when these smaller breweries came on board, uh, they made a very, very small splash but to some of us, they meant a lot. And so that's when I first started becoming interested in craft beer. And uh, in order to learn more about it, I actually became a home brewer. I started brewing my own beer at home, much like some of those early craft brewers. And this is dating back to about 1985 or so. I figured the best way to learn about beer was to learn about the ingredients and the processes and how they come together to make this wonderful product we call beer. And... So, you know, piggybacking on that, um, I, I started submitting my beers to competitions. And what I found out through that process was that there weren't enough good qualified judges to judge these beers in competition. So I became a judge. Um, there's something called the BJCP. It's the Beer Judge Certification Program. It's been around since 1986. I was one of the first 70 people in all of North America to take and pass that test. I was the very first person in the state of Illinois. I'm still active in the BJCP today, but I've also gone professional. I judge as a professional beer judge at the Great American Beer Festival, the World Beer Cup Festival of Barrel-Aged Beers right here in the Chicago area. Um, and I've judged out of country as well. Um, somewhere along the way, I also decided to do some writing and uh, became a freelance writer on the topics of beer and brewing, which led to the publication of a couple of books. And the, the, the better known titles that I've uh, written are Beer for Dummies and Home Brewing for Dummies. And uh, those are now in their second editions. And anyway, um, long story short, uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm still very much into it. And I love sharing what I've learned with others who likewise want to share or want to learn uh, what there is to learn about beer. So having said that, the way this class is going to be structured, at least somewhat loosely structured, I'm going to spend about the first somewhere between 20 minutes and a half hour presenting you with some presentations that I've uh, put together. Uh, by the way, I'm a teacher at College of DuPage. Uh, I'm an instructor for their Business of Craft Beer program. So these two presentations you're going to see tonight are essentially what I share with students of College of DuPage in the Business of Craft Beer program that they have there. So like I said, between 20 or 30 minutes of official learning via PowerPoint presentation, and then what's left of the uh, class tonight, the last half hour or so, we will spend... Um, tasting together. I, you know, hopefully you were able to go out and get the four beers that were re recommended for this class and uh, we will taste them together and uh, we will walk you, I will walk you through them one at a time. So um, I will go ahead and start. There's actually two separate PowerPoints. 
So let's get started with the first. And um, I don't I don't see where uh, anybody has the ability to uh, chat with me or speak with me. I do encourage questions if you have them. Um, I'm just not sure where I'm going to see those. Uh, uh, if you have any, please submit them. It's best that you do that as we go. I don't mind that um, because uh, we're going to be touching on a couple of different topics. And I think it's best that we answer questions on a specific topic before moving on to the next, because by the time we get to the tasting or at the end of the class, you may not remember what it was that you wanted to ask. So please, um, by all means, uh, speak up and ask questions. So hopefully this works. I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, Ariana, um, I believe that I need to be made the host in order for me to do that. I switched over the settings. You should be able to share now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, so I just call this Beer 101 because this is essentially step number one. Um, I don't want to assume too much about what you know or don't know about beer. Uh, so I apologize if some of you are already home brewers or you've done a lot uh, with beer before. And um, so you, I might be covering some ground that you already know, but please bear with us. And that we don't know that everybody's on the same page. So this is a way of making sure everyone's on the same page. Um, having said that, this is uh, something that I, I like to share with my students. Um, you know, there's, there's what you know about beer, and there's what you don't know about beer, but there's also what you don't know you don't know about beer. And, you know, having been in this game for about 30 years now, I know that people, there's a lot that people don't know about beer. So, again, forgive me, because um, I'm, I'm just going to take this from square one. And on occasion, I'm going to skip over a slide like this one. It's not relevant to this class. But here we go to the next. Um, I think it's important that we start with this concept. What is beer and what isn't beer? The very simplest definition of what beer is, beer is a fermented beverage made from cereal grain. And I will get into that concept of cereal grain in the next, the upcoming slides. So, Hold on if you have any questions about that. One thing I would like to make clear though, what I've seen many times over, I get questions from people about cider. A lot of people think cider is beer. Well, it's not. It's, it's, it never was, never will be. Cider is made from the juice of apples or pears, which means it's actually closer to wine because it's a fruit juice. Wine is from, made from grapes. Cider is made from apples or pears, both fruits. So, Beer is not cider. Cider is not beer. I've also had questions from people who think that mead is beer or, or uh, beer is mead, which is not the case. Mead is actually made from honey. The base fermentable in mead is honey. So there's no relationship between honey and grain. So therefore, mead is not beer and beer is not mead. Just remember that beer is made from cereal grain and you do just fine. Uh, another thing I like to do when I'm bringing people uh, up to speed with regards to beer is I like to, uh, you know, shoot down any myths and misconceptions. Over the years, I've heard all different kinds of myths and misconceptions. So I like to get these out of the way first thing, okay? A lot of people tend to think that dark beer is stronger than pale beer, and that's absolutely not true whatsoever. The color of the beer has no bearing on the strength of the beer at all. Not at all. The color of the beer has to do with the color of the grains that were used to make the beer. That's all. So when you have a dark beer, that simply means it, means it was made with dark grains. If you have a pale beer, it was made with pale grains. Has nothing to do with alcohol content whatsoever. Likewise, um, people think that ales, or people tend to think that ales are stronger than lagers. Again, this is not true at all. There are strong ales, there are weak ales. There are strong lagers, there are weak lagers. And if you're not sure what ales and lagers are, we will go into this in great depth in the uh, second PowerPoint. So don't worry about that. Just keep in mind that it doesn't matter if a beer is an ale or a lager. 
It has no bearing on its strength, okay? A lot of people think that ales are automatically darker than lagers. And while it is true that most of the world's darker beers happen to be ales, that's merely coincidence because there are also dark lagers. So again, color doesn't have any relationship to whether the beer is an ale or a lager. Um, the next misconception may not be so true today as much as it was when I first got into beer. Back in the day, there were not a lot of craft brewers, but there were a lot of imported beer. And a lot of people I know would buy imported beer because it was marginally more uh, alcoholic than regular domestic beer. When we talk about Budweiser or Miller or Coors or Old Style or PBR, Hams, any of those beers, they generally run in the 5% area, you know, low 5.2, 5.5, maybe, maybe even upper fours, like 4.8. Imported beer back in the day, back in the 80s, they would often come in at about five and a half to six percent, maybe even six percent. So a lot of people said, ooh, imported beer is stronger than domestic beer, so therefore I'm going to pay the extra bucks and get the imported beer. Well, today this is just absolutely not true. Um, there are breweries, these craft brewers across the country who are reviving or who have revived all these older beer styles from around the world, many of which have uh, alcohol contents easily 7, 8, 9, 10, 12%. It's not unusual these days to see beers in those ranges. So uh, whether it's imported or whether it's made domestically, it's based on beer style. Again, we will touch on this in the second uh, PowerPoint, okay? Um, and this is something else that's not so much a misconception these days, but there was a time when people thought that Bach beer was what was left at the bottom of the fermenters. Bach beer is a seasonal product. Traditionally speaking, German brewers would, would release their Bach beer every spring, okay? And so people somehow got it in their mind that they were cleaning out the vats, and this beer was a once a year type thing and it was always stronger than regular beer. And while it is true that Bach beer as a style is marginally stronger than your average beer, it's absolutely false that brewers would ever do something like this, leaving beer in the fermenter for any length of time. Beer, when it's at the brewery, when it's being brewed and aged, it's constantly being moved from one vessel to the next. And then it eventually goes to packaging, whether it's a can or a bottle or a keg. The beer is constantly on the move, so it never sits in one place for a long period of time. And so the thought of a brewer leaving a beer in a fermenter for a year is just, it's silly, okay? Last but not least, this is one of my pet peeves. I hear people refer to men, and maybe even sometimes women, who have beer bellies. And I understand that this is just a, a fun uh, way to describe somebody who might be have a little weight around the, the, the midsection of their bodies but you can't blame it on beer when we talk about what causes beer bellies so to speak it's the alcohol a lot of people aren't aware that 60 to 75 percent of all the calories not just in beer but wine and mixed drinks is the alcohol Okay, these are what we call empty calories. When your body metabolizes the alcohol, it adds on calories and in, in it, uh, it adds fat to your body. So you can't blame it on beer. It's any alcoholic beverage is going to give you a so-called beer belly. Okay, so enough of my rant. Let's move on. Let's talk about the four basic ingredients that are needed to make beer. Now, uh, they are very simply grain, and that's the cereal grain I referred to before. It's something called hops, it's yeast, and it's water. These are the four main primary ingredients needed to make beer. Now, are they the only ingredients? No, by no means. There are a lot of brewers these days who are putting all different kinds of weird things into the beers, different kinds of sugars, different, um, different kinds of grains, um, fruits, vegetables, herbs, spices, all kinds of 
wacky stuff. But the base beer is always from these four ingredients. So when I talk about cereal grains, what I mean is literally, if you can make a cereal from the grain, you can also make beer from it, all right? If you were to walk down the cereal aisle of your local grocer, you would see all these different uh, cereals made from these different grains, barley, wheat, rye, oats, corn, rice, and a couple of others. And so barley is the number one grain used to make beer. Wheat is the number two grain used to make beer. And then all these others, the rye, the oats, the corn, the rice, these are used to use as a, uh, to a lesser extent to make beer. They usually are added to a beer that is already being made from barley or wheat or a combination of barley and wheat, okay? And this is just a picture that kind of gives you an idea of some of the different grains and some of the different coloration among the grains. Um, starting from the extreme right, what we're looking at there is that's actually rye. You see those grain kernels that are kind of long and skinny? Uh, that's what rye looks like. Um, just to the left of that, that somewhat of a column of grain, these kernels are kind of short and they're more plump. Those are wheat kernels, those are wheat grains. And then uh, to the left of that, the very palest of all the grain, and in fact, every single column moving leftward, these are all barley. The difference in them is basically the color, starting with the third from the left or the, I'm sorry, the third from the right or the fourth from the left. That is what we would call base barley. All beers are made from base barley. You see it has virtually no color or very little color. Most brewers will start with a base of that barley. And then to get a colored beer, they will add different grains that have been kilned to varying degrees. And the kilning gives the grain a different color. And so when that grain is used in the beer in smaller proportions, it will transfer that color to the beer. So the beer gets darker and you will get different aromas and flavors from those grains simply because they were kilned, not unlike coffee, by the way. So moving leftward, you see the grains, the, those columns of grains get progressively darker. And by the way, this is just a brief representation of the different colorations in grain. There are many, many, many different others that could fit in between these columns but this just gives you an idea of what they might look like. And this next slide is very similar to the previous one, but it gives you an idea of how the coloration in these grains can give you different flavors. All right, I'll give you just a, a minute or two to take a look at this wheel. And I know it's difficult to read upside down, but uh, the wheel, of course, gives you an idea of how the coloration in the grain will give you different flavors and aromas in your beer. And while you're looking at that, I took a brief look at my uh, timer just to make sure I'm staying on track. And we are slightly behind time now, so I will move on. Now, when a brewer uses grain, regardless of which grain it is and what color grain it is, these are the six main things that are being derived from that grain. Number one is you're getting, well, these, these are not hierarchical. These are not, one is more important than the other, so I'm not going to give them numbers. But uh, beer gets its color from the grain. Beer gets its primary flavor from the grain. Beer gets its sweetness from the grain. And then there are two things you'll see in the next two. Um, dextrins are something that's derived from the grain, and that's what helps give beer body. When we talk about a beer being big-bodied or heavy-bodied or thin or watery-bodied, um, that's all a matter of the different grains that are used. And likewise, there are also something called proteins. And this is what helps to build the head on the beer and to maintain the beer in the glass. Last but not least are what we call the fermentable sugars. It's uh, technically those sugars are called maltose. And it's these sugars derived from the cereal grains. This is what feeds the yeast during fermentation. The yeast will eat those fermentable sugars and return they will provide the alcohol 
and the carbon dioxide in the beer. All right, plain and simple. So let's move on to hops. And hops are known by their botanical name by very few people actually, called humulus lupulus. Um, like I said, that's the botanical name. The, that's what, these are what they look like. Um, technically and botanically speaking, these are the flowers of the hop plant. Now hop, the hop plant is a vining plant. It actually grows uh, not unlike a grapevine. It will start climbing up anything that's nearby and it will make these flowers uh, at this time of the year. We're actually getting close to harvest time in, in, uh, in terms of hop plants. These uh, plants will start growing in, you know, a couple of weeks after the thaw back in, let's say, March or so. And then the plants will climb up. As I said, they're vining plants. And eventually these little hop flowers will start to grow in about late May or June. Eventually they will blossom into what you see on the screen. And this is what is harvested uh, at about this time of year, maybe a little bit later, going into late August, into September. This is what's harvested, and this is what is actually used in the beer. And uh, we're going to look at look at what hops contribute to the beer in just a second. Um, a little bit of history on hops. In Europe, uh, they've been used since the 9th century. We know that it's on the historic record. They've been cultivated since the 12th century. Now you see a 300 year difference between when they were first discovered and when they were started, uh, brewers started cultivating them. In that 300 years, brewers would simply use what mother nature provided. And it got to the point where there were so many brewers using so much hops that they said, "Uh oh, we better start cultivating these on our own or we are going to run out, okay? Um, on the next bullet point, you see that British brewers, by the way, Going back to first bullet point, I, I did say in Europe, I meant on the mainland. Okay, the German brewers, the Belgian brewers, and so on. Uh, British brewers, of course, they're across the English Channel in their own little world there on the island. They refrained from using hops for another 200 years. It wasn't until the 14th century that they started using hops. They considered hops vile, V-I-L-E. Uh, the bitterness of the hop they thought was unacceptable. They would refuse to put it in their beer. So there are five major growing regions in the world, Southeast uh, England, Northern Bavaria, the Czech Republic, parts of Poland, Tasmania, New Zealand, the Pacific Northwest, including the states of Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, and uh, British Columbia and Canada. Um, I'm going to skip ahead just to where it says that there are over 200 varieties of hops cultivated today, and hop growers are continually uh, creating new varieties every year because the brewers are demanding it because the consumer is demanding it. There are so many new beers out there with new hop varieties and we're going to continue to see this trend. All right. So why are hops used at all? Well, if beer was made just from grain and water and yeast, it'd be a relatively boring product. It would be very one-dimensional, very sweet and cloying, and not very thirst quenching either. Brewers knew hundreds of years ago that they needed something different to help balance out the sweetness of the malt. And they were using herbs and spices and grasses and herbs and vegetables and all different things to help kind of balance out the sweetness of the beer. And when they accidentally, literally stumbled across the hop in the ninth century, they said, hey, here's something new we haven't tried before. So they did. And it, it, it suited their needs. The number one thing that hops add to beer is bitterness, and it's that bitterness that offsets the sweetness of the beer. They learned much later that uh, hops also give beer a very piquant aroma, and is it a different flavor, and different hop varieties have different aromas and flavors. So you see in bullet point number three, the three primary contributions of hops to beer are the aroma, the flavor and the bitterness that are provided by the hops. They also learned over centuries of usage that there are two secondary contributions of hops to beer, and that is shelf life. Um, there's something called beta acids, which helps beer to remain fresher longer 
due to those uh, uh, beta acids. And the hops also aid in head retention. I said about the grains that it's the proteins that create the head, and that still, still holds true. But they learn that the hops also help retain that head retention. All right. So this is just a slide to give you an idea. There's no need for you to read everything that's on the slide. It just gives you an idea that if you look around the perimeter of this circle, you'll see that there's different descriptors for hop aromas and flavors, floral, fruity, citrus, herbal, earthy, slash grassy, evergreen, spicy. These are the, some of the different aromas and flavors from hops. And then all the colored names you see, these are just some of the different hop varieties that exist. As I said before, there are over 200 of them. So these are just some of the ideas. Uh, so it's just an idea of some of the hops that exist out there and how they're used for their aromatics and flavoring. So we're gonna progress to yeast. And most people don't think much about yeast. Um, it's not really necessary. Brewers don't talk about it as far as marketing is concerned. So much, most consumers don't think about it. But technically yeast is in the fungus family. This might surprise you as a beer drinker. That's probably not the most appetizing thing you've heard all day. They come from the genus Saccharomyces, which when broken down means sugar fungus. I said before that the sugar in beer is called maltose from the grain. The yeast eats that sugar and in return provides the alcohol and carbon dioxide. So of the thousands and thousands of yeast strains known in the world, not all of them are good for beer making. There's only certain strains. Saccharomyces happens to be one of those uh, genuses. That's good for beer. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to bullet point number five, where it says ale is top fermenting and lager is bottom fermenting. We're going to start to talk a little bit about these two classifications, ales and lagers. We know that there are two different types of yeast strains. One is uh, makes ales and one of them makes lagers. One floats at the top of the beer when it's fermenting. That's why we call ales top fermenting. And the other one sinks to the bottom of the fermenter. That's why we call lagers bottom fermented. All right. And I'm going to skip that last bullet point and move on to, excuse me, double click there. Okay. And so it's yeast that causes fermentation. You see from the rather uh, gross uh, picture on the right-hand side of the screen, you see the, um, the rather crude uh, cartoon of the yeast eating the sugar and then expelling alcohol and CO2. And then there's a third thing called esters. That's a fruitiness, but not all yeast do that. But all yeast do create alcohol and CO2, okay? So that's how the beer gets its alcohol. That's how the beer gets its carbonation. Now we're gonna move to the last of the primary ingredients and that's water. And again, most consumers don't think much about water. Um, but brewers do because beer is about 90 to 95 percent water. And so if you want to make good beer, you have to start by using good water. All right. Now, water sources differ considerably depending on where the water, where the brewer, the brewery is and what the water source is. Some breweries set up next to rivers. Some breweries set up next to lakes. Some breweries set up next to uh, glacial runoff. Some breweries have access to underground aquifers. Depending on where these breweries set up hundreds and hundreds of years ago, whatever the water source was, it had to be good and it had to be plentiful. And that's what helped to create some of the beer styles that we are familiar with today. And um, due to modern science and chemistry specifically, brewers around the world can manipulate their water by adding or removing chemicals or minerals. So let's say, for instance, there's a specific water source in Germany, but an American brewer wants to brew a beer with that water. They don't have to have that water shipped from Germany. They can simply make their own here in the United States. They have the ability to manipulate the water by adding or subtracting things from that water to make it match any other water source anywhere in the world. So since we're in the Chicago area, I get the question all the time. Um, Chicago Metropolitan Breweries 
use water from Lake Michigan. And yes, it is very good brewing water. So rest assured, if you're drinking beers made locally, they're starting with good brewing water. So we're going to talk briefly about the brewing process because, again, we are running a little bit short on time. Uh, using this, uh, this schematic, starting from the upper left, you see where it says milling. When I was talking about grains before, the grains uh, are shipped to the brewery. Before the brewer can actually use those grains, he has to mill them. He has to uh, break the outer shell of those grains. Now, when I say milling, uh, a lot of people think, okay, he's making flour. Well, no, <laughs> that would actually be a big mistake on, on the part of the brewer. All he, he wants to do is run the mill th or the grain through the mill to crack the outer husk of the grain because there's something on the inside that's starchy interior is called the endosperm. He wants to be able to have access to that endosperm because that's where all the sugars are. All right. So once the grain is milled, you see the next vessel there is called mashing. It's actually called the mash ton. And you see the water droplets there. That means that water is being infused into that vessel. So the grain and the water are coming together and they're making kind of a porridge. And it's while that, that porridge is being stirred on the inside. And this is very warm water, by the way. What's happening is there are something called enzymes within the grain. Those enzymes are being activate, activated by the warm grain, and they are breaking down that starchy interior and turning that endosperm into soluble sugars, okay? So over the course of an hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours, he should have, or, or those enzymes should have broken down all of that starchy material and turned it into soluble sugars. So now that liquid is very thick and sugary, not unlike a thin syrup, okay? All right, so now he has this thick porridge consisting of the grain husks and this sugary liquid. He has to find a way to separate that sugary liquid from those uh, uh, starchy husks, or I'm sorry, just the husks. So everything is transferred over to the next vessel. You'll see it's called a loudering ton. And it's like a giant sieve. Think of it just as a big colander or sieve. He runs everything into that. And what happens is the sugary liquid is drained away and all the husks are held back. So the sugary liquid is then transferred onto the boiling kettle or brew kettle, call it what you will. And it's at this point in time that the hops are introduced to the beer. And the beer, the, the, actually it's called, technically it's called wort, W-O-R-T. It's a German word meaning unfermented beer. Um, they, uh, the hops are added at this point, and during the boiling process, components of the hops are actually liquefied also, and the bitterness, the alpha acids and the beta acids that you saw on a slide several slides ago, those are actually also solubilized in the sugary liquid. And eventually, uh, the brewer will have derived everything he wants from the hops, the, uh, the aromatics, the flavoring, the bittering, all that good stuff. But now he has the sugary liquid that's, again, it has this organic material from the hops in it. He has to find a way to separate this two. And this time he uses a, um, a whirlpool. By running all this liquid into this whirlpool, He's able to cause all the organic material to collect up in the middle of the whirlpool while he can drain off the sugary liquid from the side of the whirlpool. It works very well, actually. So keeping in mind that this liquid at this point in time is still pretty hot. It was boiling, and now it's slowly coming down in temperature, but he wants to cool it down more rapidly now that the hops have been removed. He sends it through a cooling device, and this is important for two reasons. Number one, this sweet sugary liquid that's, that's very warm is very susceptible to contamination. If there are any bacteria anywhere in the system or in the brewery, they can attack the beer at this point where it's, it's, where it's most vulnerable. So reason number one to cool it is to protect it from the bacteria. Reason number two is because now 
he wants to send this sugary liquid into the fermenter. Now, you should be following along. You can see the it says fermenting down there. That's what we call the fermenter. It's an enclosed vessel. This liquid is going to go inside the fermenter, and you can see it shows above the yeast, the little uh, barrel of yeast. He's going to add the yeast to the fermenter. The yeast is going to start eating those fermentable sugars that I talked about before. And it's at this point in time when fermentation is begun that the beer starts to become actual beer because the alcohol is in it for the first time. At some point in time when fermentation is done, the yeast will have eaten just about all the sugar that's left over. Uh, the yeast has to be removed. And uh, so then the liquid, that what is now beer, will be transferred to what you see those two tanks together, known as the maturing tank. They will spend an additional amount of time, and they're usually, excuse me, a matter of a couple of weeks. Ales are produced much quicker because they're fermented at a much warmer temperature, usually only a couple of weeks. Lagers, because they're cold fermented, they will spend a, a probably double that time, usually a month to a month and a half in the maturing tanks. At some point in time when the beer is deemed done, they will be run through the filtering process to take out any other organic material, any leftover yeast, anything that should not be in the beer at that point in time. When the beer is done being filtered, it will then go into the can, the bottle, or the keg, and then it goes out into distribution. All right? So I hope everybody was able to follow along with all of that. Um, again, I have to move along uh, relatively quickly here. I'm just going to uh, actually, I'm going to close this down, open up my next screen. Hopefully it did open up. All right, we're going to talk briefly about beer styles, and I'm going to have to go through this pretty quick. Um, most beer styles come to us from three countries in the world, uh, Belgium, Germany, and Great Britain. Just about any beer style in the world can trace the roots back to these three countries. There are over a hundred different beer styles in the world, and there's obviously not enough time to look at this. I just wanted to give you an idea of how confusing this topic can be to somebody who's not familiar with it. Um, all right, here I talked about ales and lagers. They're classified by how they're fermented. Ales are fermented with ale yeast uh, at warm temperatures for short periods of time. Lagers are fermented with lager yeasts at cold temperatures for longer periods of time. Now here you see kind of a hierarchy. You see that beer is anything, you know, at the top there, it's anything fermented. It's a fermented beverage made with cereal grain. Below that you see the two classifications of ale and lager. Below that you see the different beer styles. And by the way, this is just a brief representation of the different styles that exist. I, I already said there's over a hundred of them. And then below that is what we call substyles. So a lot of different styles have what we call substyles, okay? And this gives you an idea of how the style called stout has many substyles. The style we know as Bach beer has many substyles. And this holds true for many, many different beer styles, okay? So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and exit this uh, PowerPoint as well. We need to move on to the beer tasting and hopefully you all have your beers with you at this time. What I would like to do is start with the one, it's a Pilsner and I recommended that you start with Pilsner or Kell as far as the specific brand. It's not necessary to have Pilsner or Kell, this brand, but the reason why I wanted to start with Pilsner is because of the four beers that I recommended, these are four different beer styles, uh, this actually has the least amount of flavor. So it's always best to taste in a, the proper progression, okay? Start with the least tasting one and work your way towards the one with the most taste, okay? So if you guys want to go ahead and open up your beer and pour it. And by the way, uh, you might want to pour it, unless you have four different glasses, you might want to pour yourself just a small amount. Now, here is the Pilsner Urkel that I have. I'm going to go ahead and pour just a small amount in here. And I'm going to tell you a bit about the beer. You see that this is very pale golden, all right? 
very, very clear. Um, you see that it's got a nice, what we call bleached head on it. I purposely poured it kind of rough to, to work up a head. When you create a head on the beer, it gives you, uh, it, it, it does two things. Number one is it brings the CO2 out of the beer so you're not swallowing all that gassiness. You really shouldn't end up with all the gas in your stomach. You should allow a lot of the gas to just drift off into the air. When the CO2 comes out of solution, not only does it create a nice head to look at, but it also brings with it the aromatics, which allow us to smell the beer. If you have a glass that's similar to this in shape, this is actually designed to capture and concentrate the aromas in the glass. So when you drink, your nose is actually inside the glass. Smelling your beer is just as important as tasting it. Those are intertwined. If you can't smell your beer, you're not going to be able to taste your beer very well either. So what are we smelling here? Basically, it's all, it, most of it comes down to the malt. You might get a little bit of a honeyed aroma. Um, if you pick up on any spiciness, in all likelihood, that's the hops. Okay, the hops that are used to brew this beer are, tend to be very spicy. Very clean across the palate. Pretty two-dimensional. It's just the malt and the hops together. No fruitiness, no other off aromas or flavors. It's crisp. It finishes dry. It's got a little bit of bitterness. Um, this is the beer that was first created in 1842, this brand specifically in the Czech Republic. That's why it says Pilsen or Kel. That means original source. It comes from the town of Pilsen in the Czech Republic. And this beer is what spawned all the other Pilsner style beers, including all the Miller products, the Bud products, the Coors products. Those are all Pilsner knockoffs. Okay. So, this is the one that started it. I thought maybe you should try it if you haven't already. And I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next beer, which is, again, the least tasting of the remaining three. This is a pale ale. By the way, the last one was a lager, so that was uh, bottom fermented. We're going to move on to the pale ale, which is top fermented. This is, as the name says, it's a pale ale. If you go ahead and grab that beer, or any pale ale can do it, doesn't have to be Sierra Nevada. I chose this one because Sierra Nevada is one of the very first craft breweries that ever opened up in the United States. It dates back to 1980, so very, very new back then, now 40 years ago. It just celebrated its 40th anniversary. This is the prototypical American pale ale. And I'm going to pour myself just a, a small bit here. And you can see from its color and uh, the way it looks in the glass, this looks very, very similar to the Pilsner. But because it was brewed as a, an ale, it's going to smell and taste differently. Um, there are a lot of hops in pale ales, generally speaking. And this one has a bit of a spiciness, but it can also be described as being maybe a little bit floral and especially uh, you might pick up on a little bit of a citric character. You might also be able to pick up on maybe just a little bit of pine. As I said much earlier that hop, different hop varieties have different characteristics. So pale ales like the IPAs that they spawned uh, tend to be hoppier beers, uh, more piquant noses, and definitely more hoppy flavor. This has a richer malt flavor, even more so than the, the Pilsner. It's not as dry. It does have some hop flavor, uh, some hop bittering. It's, it's not over the top. Uh, in this day and age, because this beer is now 40 years old, you know, when it first was it when it was first introduced, it made waves. A lot of people tasted it, and, and it was a new taste experience. Today, with all the IPAs out there, this actually, no pun intended, this pales in comparison. It doesn't really, uh, it's not as imposing 
to the palate as people thought it did 40 years ago. But I thought it was a good idea that you taste this to get an idea of how this whole craft beer thing started with one of the very first pale ales in the United States. So I'm just checking, checking my time here. Is this one last swirl and taste? And by the way, as beers warm up, more of the aromas and more of the flavors will come out. When you are tasting beer or any beverage that's very cold, you don't get to smell them or taste them as much. It's the warmth or the warming up of the beer that actually opens the beer up. If any of you guys are wine drinkers, you've probably heard this before. If you allow the beer to open up as it warms, you'll get more aromatics, you'll get more flavor. These beers are meant to be drunk in the 44 to 46 degree range. That's actually the appropriate uh, temperature. Most people have the refrigerator set at 40 degrees. Most bars have their taps set at 36 degrees. That's pretty cold. That's, that's when you're drinking the, the Millers, the, the Budweiser's, and the Coors. Those beers are meant to be drunk cool because there's not much to taste, as much to taste as these beers. So. All right. The next beer you should reach for, hopefully you're ready. This is uh, what we call Weiss beer or Weizen beer. You can call it either word. Um, and I provided several different, uh, different brand names for you to purchase because a lot of different German breweries produce what is essentially the same beer style. This is a German style wheat beer, but it's very, very different. If you've had any wheat ales from your local craft brewery, don't confuse those with this. This is very specifically Bavarian wheat beer. And it's, like I said, it's called either Weiss beer, which means white, or it's Weizen beer, which means wheat. Uh, between the two terms, I think Weizen is, is more descriptive because these beers, by law, must be brewed with 50% minimum of wheat, okay? Most beers here in the United States, if they contain wheat at all, they're usually very sm much smaller quantities, maybe 20, 25, 30% wheat. Brewers here in the United States don't like working with wheat malt because it's more difficult to work with, and I don't have time to go into all that. But this is a very specific beer style. It is a um, it is an ale. It's top fermented, but it's brewed or fermented with a very specific yeast. All German brewers use, it may be a house yeast, but over centuries, it's essentially the same throughout Germany. Now, Weizen beers are considered summary type beers. Um, you'll see that they throw a huge head. Um, I would maybe pour just a little bit too aggressively. You'll also see that this is not necessarily clear. It does have some particulate matter. It's mostly yeast. A lot of these beers are packaged with the yeast in them. Um, uh, people know by now, I think, with all the hazy beers out there, that there's really no problem with drinking beer uh, with yeast in them or beer yeast of any kind. It's actually good for you. It's high in uh, the B-complex vitamins. So keep that in mind. Now, you see that this is a very tall, frothy, bleached head, and that's very typical of a German Weizen beer. Now, one of the things or a couple of the things that are very normal to get out of this kind of beer. As you're smelling this, it's going to smell very different from the Pilsner and very different from the Pale Ale. Uh, as I mentioned, this beer style is brewed with a different kind of yeast. Um, it, uh, the components, I was trying to think of the word, the components... Uh, that are contributed to this beer to most people's uh, sense of smell and palate are banana esters. So it might taste like a very, or an overripe banana or maybe a Laffy Taffy. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, that candy. It's a very chewy uh, candy, but it's called Laffy Taffy and it has banana flavor to it. A lot of people uh, describe what they smell and taste in these beers like that. You also might pick up on clove. It's a very natural byproduct of the yeast made to, to uh, ferment these beers. So clove and banana, very, very normal. 
And what's interesting is brewers in Germany know that they can manipulate how much clover, how much banana is in their beer simply by raising or lowering the temperature of the fermentation, okay? So as you taste your way through different German or Bavarian Weizen beers, you may notice that one brand has more banana, one brand has more clove. Rich multi characterness beer, really intense maltiness, which is fantastic. Not a lot of hoppiness, not a lot of hop flavor or bitterness because it's not supposed to be there. Brewers use very, very small quantities of hops when they're brewing this beer. What you really expect is the maltiness and the character of the yeast. That's what makes this beer style what it is. That's what makes it fun and interesting to drink. It's mostly the yeast characteristic that makes this beer what it is. Not about the hops, okay? So I am getting some banana. It's not overly, it's not in your face, but there is that background banana character. The clove is subdued. It's really underdone, but that's okay. I mean, it doesn't have to be front and center. Very tasty, very fun drinking beer. And as I said, it is a, uh, a summery type beer. Um, Germans typically drink that mostly in the summertime. It's, uh, it's meant to be a thirst quencher when the weather is warm. So last but not least, I suggested uh, we uh, taste through a stout. It does not necessarily have to be Guinness, but any uh, British or Irish stout would suffice. Um, I chose this one because this beer is actually, not this particular beer, but this beer style, this brand name, is over 250 years old. It was established in 1759. Um, most people who are familiar with stouts, this is the one that comes to mind. So this is... Usually when people start drinking dark beers, this is that stepping stone beer into starts, stouts and other dark beers. Uh, I would like to mention also, you see the word draft on there? That's denoting that this has a widget. I don't know if, I don't know if you can hear that, but there is a widget in here. When I pour this beer out, that widget is going to release nitrogen. So I'm going to get what is essentially a nitrogen pour out of a can. It's meant to emulate when you order a Guinness on draft. Okay. The key to this is to open and pour very quickly. All right, you can see it's already frothing. That's the nitrogen in the widget coming out. Now, as I pour this, I'm going to pour a little bit more than I poured of the other beers to let you see this effect. Now it looks very milky right now. You only see a little bit of beer and a lot of uh, the milky part. And then you see the eventual head at the top there. It's that milkiness that's all eventually going to turn to beer. That's what they refer to as the cascade. These are all the nitrogen and CO2 bubbles cascading upwards into the head. And the head of course is going to grow. And you see that it's nice and thick and frothy that's due to the nitrogen in the beer. It's a combination of nitrogen and CO2. I mentioned earlier about fermentation. When the yeast eats the sugars in the, in the wort, it converts it to CO2. That's the natural process of creating CO2. So 99% of all the beers out there have CO2 in them to carbonate it. Only when the nitrogen is artificially added to the beer as it is here, with the, the widget in the can, um, or it's artificially introduced uh, at, at, when you go to a bar or a brewery, it's artificially introduced from a canister of, of nitrogen. Uh, it's a more expensive gas. It's, um, it actually does not dissolve into the beer. What you saw there, it was not dissolved like the CO2 is dissolved. It was actually just coming out of the widget, which is a little ball inside the can. But um, the bottom line is that it gives you the desired effect of that nice, real thick, frothy head. What also is part of the effect is that the body of the beer is 
the perception of this beer is different because most of the CO2 has been scrubbed out by the nitrogen. As you taste this beer, it's going to taste, or it's going to feel actually, uh, the carbonation is going to be very, very low to none. So it's going to feel velvety across the, the tongue and palate. And that is exactly why they invented this idea of nitrogenating beers. This way you can drink more beer. You're not, you're not actually uh, consuming the CO2. So it allows you to drink more beer. You don't get all filled up with the gas from the beer. Okay. So what are we smelling here? Well, I'm getting a very, uh, like a toffee aroma. That's the very first thing I get. It's uh, like a burnt caramel or burnt toffee aroma. Behind that are some of the dark grains that obviously made the beer dark, uh, which will also in turn give it a bittersweet chocolate or some say a coffee, a roasty coffee type aroma. Now, a lot of people don't really care for that. People aren't into dark beers, but I always approach them by saying, well, do you drink coffee? If you do, think of this as cold, uncarbonated coffee. And, you know, sometimes that works. As I mentioned, if your beer was nitrogenated, what's left in the glass right now is it has almost no dissolved carbonation whatsoever. It's very, very light in CO2. It washes across the palate very easily. Um, it does leave behind some of that roasty, dark grain character. It's almost like uh, strong coffee or, or uh, old coffee, like day-old coffee. Um, you might even pick up uh, like bittersweet chocolate, baker's chocolate, unsweetened. Um, but that's all what makes a classic Guinness. And of course, this typifies the style that we're talking about when we say Irish stout. Now, there are, just so you're not confused, there are many different kinds of stout styles. This is the Irish dry. There's also the British sweet style. There's uh, oatmeal stout. There's imperial stout. So those are all different, not to be confused with what's in your glass right now. Um, taking a quick peek at my clock, we are now just minutes away from the end of the class. Um, uh, that brings to the end of the tasting portion and for the most part, uh, everything else there is to talk about. But I haven't taken any questions yet. If anybody has any questions, now would be a very appropriate time for that. Feel free. I invite your questions if anybody has them. All right, just... Wondering if there are any other topics that I haven't touched or discussed right here. Um, I know I ran through a lot of information in a very short period of time. Hopefully you were able to play along. Um, also hoping that this might become a little bit more of a regular thing. We can explore more beers and talk about more, uh, talk about brewing more in, in greater depth, talk about beer styles in greater depth. Um, but even if not, I do encourage all of you with any interest in beer to learn about it, whether you're online, whether you uh, check out your, your library for local books on beer and brewing, uh, by all means, visit your local breweries. We have some very, very good ones here in the greater Orland area, in Tinley Park, uh, in Willow Springs, in Lamont, Lockport, uh, they're all over the place these days, so I encourage you to get out there, try them out. Yes, even in these days of COVID, some of them are open, and they are, they are definitely uh, following uh, guidelines. So if you can get out, support them, and learn about beer at, at every opportunity. Strongly encourage it. Um, that is it for me. Again, if anybody has any questions, now would be the time. I will hang out just for another couple of minutes to see if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, I believe we are going to bring this to an end within the next minute or so. At this time, I would like to say thank you for tuning in and cheers. And thank you so much, Marty, for giving the presentation. I know we wanted to do it in person and I thank you so much for adapting it to a virtual presentation for us. Glad we were able to do this. 
Thank you. And thank you everybody for tuning in. And I hope you guys also are thanking, I know you don't have your mics on, <laughs> but <laughs> are thanking Marty for giving the presentation. I hope you guys had some fun, were able to taste some beers. And thank you for coming out tonight. And I hope everyone has a good night. Bye, everyone. <laughs>